Hi, my name is Paul Temme. Notes of Descent is a reflective, poetic and spoken word journey that starts where I grew up in the Weald of Kent and ends here on the north coast of Cornwall via two decades working in the City of London. It's more than just a physical journey though. It's one that along the way wrestles with the alarming uh, challenges faced by the environment and the injustices both past and present imposed on us by our economic systems. It grapples with my issues of faith, belief, doubt, the lack of easy answers and an uneasy reconciliation with collective and personal histories. The journey is mostly about asking questions. Questions I have had to ask myself, many of which have forced a change of thinking and behaving. The format starts with a poem describing the North Coast where I live and then moves into a collection of spoken word pieces and links that reflect the journey I just described. I end with another poem about the North Coast. I hope you enjoy. The wind makes sure, carrying ocean silence inland, overwhelming the dunes' soft sand defences, searching arches of caves for rock runes. God was here, they say, but now he's gone, blown like foam over split cliff, snagging on gorse and heather, anchored against Cornish time, Cornish weather. The wind makes sure, baffling the path wanderer, his broad back against the library of stones, spines in rows, each eon bound in one granite page. He the lone witness to a dark cormorant journey, the gull pivot and dive into the wave. The wind makes sure, warms the bay's outstretched arms, fills the valley's cupped palms, flutes upstream, unseen piper, brushes the hawk, still, still as a sniper, hidden in the needles of the tallest pine, in the woods where I lie drifting, in an eddy of time. <laughs> it wasn't always this way, lying in a wood or watching the Atlantic. I trod a very different path back in the day. It's an unfashionable word, repent, but if you've got the time right now, I'll share my attempt at atonement in these notes of dissent. First, let's go back some decades to teenage years spent under Maggie Thatcher's stern gaze, and from that, early age, me and my friends got refracted through her monetarist prism that split out the dark hues of individualism and acquisitive ambition. The careers officer had suggested to me the army, but shooting anyone, anything, wasn't my aim in life. Well then, the police, could you arrest your father? You're tall and you do sports, he said. These are the careers for you, he said. Thanks, but I'll take economics A-level instead. I had no particular leaning towards defending borders or maintaining law and order or reading my old man's legal rights and locking him up for the night. <clears throat> so I began to learn about mixed economies. Demand, supply and tan staffle. Tan staffle. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And we were a scruffy sixth form bunch. In a windowless classroom, second floor. Last one in, please close the door. Economics, day one, back to school. He teaches us the Tan Staffel rule. The principle stays with me. The implication, nothing's free. Our semi-skimmed lives homogenised in a warehouse that's now planet-sized. And not just selling clothes and cars, designer brands and Jaguars, but everything, eventually. You, me... The air we breathe, sunlight filtering through the leaves, moonbeams on a winter's eve, slows and black currents off the path, midday light, midnight dark, birth, youth and growing old, everything bought and sold. And day two, it's the ghost of economists past, we're haunted by Smith, Keynes, Marx, capitalist casinos, Hegelian huddles, the whole wretched thing is already a muddle. I switch from a cancelist to tr free trade liberalism and back again. 
via the exchange rate mechanism. Let Adam's infamous invisible hand lead this Alice through this blunderland of depressions, recessions, booms and busts, roads of silk and belts of rust. By day three, I'm sick of it. The balance of payments, deficits, financial regulatory equivalents, a billion dollar economic stimulants, a money culture, monoculture, the circling of hedge fund vultures, financing wars, coup d'etats, local elites and petty bourgeois. Day four, it's the tools and tricks of trade, how foreign debt remains unpaid. Microcredit, payment in lieu, rent return rate and net present value. IMF, World Bank, Security Council, conditional loans sound their death knell. I yield to the gods of this underworld. If I had a white flag, it would be unfurled. And it's dark in here, so I search for light. But the fires are stoked throughout day five. Diminishing returns, hyperinflation, corporate power over sovereign nation. Returns on investment, marginal gains, modes of production, rates of exchange, deregulation for perfect markets were all potential advertising targets. Demand-led growth, compound interest, and if you've lost your shirt, sir, then buy a string vest. Day six. We arrive at the economic crunch. I get it. I get it. There's no free lunch. My stomach shrunk by fiscal squeeze, stagnation, austerity and credit freeze. I pick my way through the monetary maze, the pound in my pocket is worth less these days. Day seven, that's it. Enough of this shit. But leaving's harder than a no-deal Brexit. In a system designed to make me purchase, I tell myself I don't want to buy into this. But the dice gets rolled and suddenly the game's on. I'll get credit card bills with my full name on and a carbon footprint at least size 10, and supermarket vouchers every now and then, and a landfill site that's fit to bust, an extinction angst from dawn till dusk. You see, I look weeks a long time in economics, break even points, losses, profits. The more material I have to draw on, the more I feel like an educated moron, and I think of that classroom on the second floor, how my mind closes as he shuts the door. Tan Staffel gives me an inkling, but requires from me more critical thinking. I feel I've lost the key to this cell. Well, thank God. There's the end of Lesson Bell. I leave my desk, I walk out the door, descend the stairs from the second floor. Economics A-level was just downgraded, like Greece and Spain when their economies faded. Outside, the air is still free to breathe. The sun is shining and it doesn't charge the leaves. The hedgerow black currants are tasting sweet and I ask the birds, did you pay to eat? And suddenly I have a hunch. We may have been wrong about that free lunch. Well, perhaps that's how it should have been. More critical thinking. If only I'd had a letter from the older to the younger me, an arm around the shoulder, from a father I hadn't helped incarcerate, to help me relax into a more peaceful state of mind, a reflective, more self-examined life, something more heartfelt rather than a step onto the conveyor belt. But if I lived that time again, I'm not sure I would have heeded the advice. And when the city came calling, everything that glistened was gold. The streets of the square mile were paved with it. I don't recall how I got on board, but a press gang had reputedly been abroad, looking for the chance to sign up unsuspecting undergraduate pups. For a hundredway sack of silver coins, a chance to taste some alpha loins and create opportunities with our college guile, we joined the crew of HMS Square Mile. From our desks we sailed for foreign soil. We rampaged pillaged, kept the spoils. With Google, we located the heart of Mother Earth and with spreadsheets, we estimated the sum of her net worth. And we had a motto, make your dreams go. If you had a money-making vision, we could make it so. We had the markets, we had the license, we had the strategies and the white collar violence. 
And there was almost nothing we couldn't get if goals were set and targets met, all financed by subordinated, insubordinate, unreported debt, all offset by hedged bets, the lure of private jets, and executed by extractive mindsets. And there was almost no one we couldn't use. No one was above or below abuse that couldn't be bullied, intimidated, shanked, excluded, forced to walk the plank, measured, weighed and found inadequate. Ridiculed, flayed and handed a bonus cut. It's going to hurt, but try not to squeal. Getting screwed by the system, that's just part of the deal. Yeah. We didn't ask questions or mention the source of the funding, the morality of our lead into gold financial alchemy until the crash came, anyway. A Smaugian meltdown, fire from the sky in the shape of subprime. A few years later, I was wandering in the lunch hour amongst the tents occupied by the 99% in the grounds of St Paul's Cathedral, less sure of it all. It was like I'd heard a distant trumpet call and I was no longer convinced about the strength of Jericho's walls. She offered me a cup of tea and a joint and after a couple of puffs I was nodding to the point she was making but honestly, I was already there. I was in a silk tie and she was in her tie-dye skirt yet we were brother and sister. We talked about how it could all be different. There was another road we might yet take. I confessed I'd started to worry about the state of the planet. I knew my recycling of plastic and glass was not going to cut it somehow. Where did it all go wrong? I didn't want to trivialise things, easy answers about humankind falling, a Neanderthalian original sin. When did humans become an organism that lives separately from their ecosystem? Why did Farmer Cain feel it necessary to have his pastoralist brother slain? Had Abel's goats strayed into his wheat field and reduced that year's commodity yield? I could no more pin it on a serpent, Eve and an apple core. But just to be sure, I took one more look at Genesis chapter 4. Disconnected, blind, we must retreat. Seek out Eden's evening shade, escape the all-consuming heat. Grope back along the pathway. On our knees, if needs be, that stony and unyielding ground that lacerates souls, that lacerates souls... Until the fork in the road be found, the way was up, it seems, not down. That path led us from some higher power to shard, cross rail and cooling tower, unleashed on her, our mother, lover, sister, friend, Rhineland Cole and Endergalend, Wall Street crashes, Gilets Jaunes clashes, Alberta tar sands on indigenous lands. We went from paradise to an industrial norm. Marked by the forming of each named storm, we must retreat. The walls close fast, pick up our feet, pick up the path, back along the road most taken. Extinction alley, godforsaken, strewn with carcass husks, rhino horns, elephant tusks, neo nicotinized bugs, tiger rugs, Monsanto, one season seeds, pervasive monoculture weeds. We must go back. But the way is lost. Scoured by a million moonlit frosts, bleached by our star's white heat, and crushed into the fine grey dust in which our Lamborghinis rust. Ten thousand years of separation, spade, plough, crop rotation, fires lit, tunnels drilled, the blood of Abel spilled. He paid the price of an unacceptable sacrifice. Eden lost, knowledge gained. And with us, with us, with us, walks the ghost of Cain. At a mortgage, school fees, a family, and a hungry pension to feed, not to mention my own paranoid greed. Because I can always picture a rainy day that I'll need to pay for. So, keep my head down, work harder at being a better father, one that provides. The nine to five was no longer sufficient, my goal setting no longer efficient enough. But I was sat there at the quarterly budget meeting, all the great and the good assembled and greeting each other. But I knew that it was now all different. Somehow, 
somewhere on the career journey to the top, I'd made an unscheduled pit stop. I'd become a heretic, a non-believer, an outsider, an outrider. I knew it to be true because at meetings like this, I would normally take down notes, question the statistics, but instead I'm writing this piece as each divisional and regional head takes their turn in preaching what they'll learn, the growth, the profit, each one beating louder on their chest. This isn't a budget meeting, it's a pissing contest. So, I rename the talks by all these divisional heads as presentations delivered by the talking dead. On growth figures, scratched on the backs of tarot card packs and blasted into graphs, whose black and red lines rise and plummet, marking the feared trough, the desired summit. A fantasy land, revealed by sleight of hand and by brash, bold brands and the exalted, sacred business plan penned by brutes in suits. A plan stitched together with half-truths that wove between the red-listed elephants in the room, their heads stooped. We sit, our neoliberal psychosis eased somehow under PowerPoint hypnosis. We sit, our minds tuned to a jet stream bandwidth, relentlessly carrying the prevailing myth. No search for meaning, no study of truth, no dime of dissent, no digging for roots. No counter-punching narrative, no deceits unravelled, no compelling visions, no road less travelled. And no speaker's corner, no witness stand, no public space, no sacred land. We dare not blaspheme. We took the oath to serve everlasting holy growth. And we kneel now before a new trinity, tears, pain, inequality, and the talking dead, emptiers of life's spark. We deliver pizzas after dark, seek healing with evening pilates and medium strength nutmeg lattes. And we live in the clear cut forest glades under the shade of the monetary money tree, rooted in the excrement of free trade, and we swim in the plasticised sea, we walk through fast food debris, spend, consume, live in debt, die in regret, and burn carbon, and burn more carbon, and go to war for carbon with weapons, research, finance made, and in a six billion dollar trade, a trialled on Yemeni settlements, while we condemn all senseless violence. We tramp the path laid out for us. We, the self-suppressed and oppressed West, depressed and medicated with not one magic pill, but a million drops of anaesthetizing TV thrills, our digital codeine vaccines, numbing our routines. And the velvet-clad corporate iron fist snuffs out independent thought, replaces with reductionist tales of common sense and demands for acquiescence. The talking dead are handing out a suitably tailored nuclear shroud, a greenhouse gas chamber and a mushroom cloud, a shopping mall, a climate chaos pool and the comfort of a border wall. What was happening to me? Perhaps I was tired, jaded, just needed a break. I didn't have the freedom or the funds to take a yearned for sabbatical. I was going to have to be more pragmatical. Anyway, the doctor said I must slow down. She gave me something to help me sleep and offered me a course in CBT. And for good measure, with regards to the blood pressure, I created some me time, evening walks a bike ride at the weekend, a pint with a friend, unwind, get some perspective, some balance, maybe some time for a pastime. I'd let the bike wheels glide through the lattice lanes of the low wheeled. Or I'd stroll through orchards and past those houses where I lived with Vita Sackville West as my guide. I'd walk side by side with the poet of Kent, the chronicler of life here less than a century ago. Her meticulous pen making us intimate with landscape and season. Beauty is not always in a scarlet robe. 
She wears an old black shawl. She flouts the flesh and shows the bone when winter trees are tall. More beautiful than fact, maybe. The shadow on the wall. I'd loved Vita's words from the first time I'd heard them. I grew up there, wandering along the Kent hedgerows, and yet I could still get lost in Sackville West country. I needed to find myself some space in the Garden of England and take some inspiration from the verse penned by the bard of Sissinghurst. But the truth was that even though I knew each and every etched line as if it were a map of my own face, I no longer recognised this place. More beautiful than fact may be the shadow on the wall. A shopping mall, a climate chaos pool and the comfort of a border wall. <laughs> Following doctor's orders, I try to sit mindfully and see green leaves pristine against sapphire sky and cream clouds where circling buzzards call. I watch the tall grass brush against the churchyard wall, watch the whisper of westerly wind. Breathe out, breathe in, I tread softly and feel the soft clay of the wheel yield against my heel, earth which births spartan oaks, remnants of a forest cloak, before rape field and hedgerow, before flight paths, Eurostar and M20 peak flow. I pass unhurried, lest my slipstreams rip and strip the blossom from cherry, apple, quince and pear, whose defiant stems through asphalt tear gaps of light and air to breathe and grow towards the jets and turboprops, heading for Heathrow. I step silently through dormitory towns, blinds pulled down where account managers sleep, a short commute from Castle Keep, breaking work cycles with fitful slumbers, walking in midnight dreams with legal briefs and budget numbers. And I move fearfully and skirt the dreaded pedals, determined to unsettle a map, the mines and fracking cracks that suck dark fuels from Stone Age tracks, a shun the CPO that speeds up the Dover run, that widens the A20. The A21. No. No, I no longer recognise the place. Busyness and business had brought me to my knees and my memories of my childhood garden had faded while I grieved. What was happening to me? I'd been half asleep. Was this what it felt like to be woke? I pinched myself, I gave myself a poke. It was just a phase and my outrage was fake, surely. And much more of this and I'd be labelled a snowflake. It was just a phase, surely. But if it was self-hate, maybe I'd start loving myself enough to change. There was too many of us being left behind and an economy gone wrong. The last chopper out of Saigon had been and gone. There was a run on the pound and not enough food banks to go around and glaciers retreating the planet overheating. And I was nursing a hidden grief, wrestling with a colonial past and losing my religion fast. Was I having a breakdown? Where was all the anxiety from? I no longer wanted to make other people's dreams go or handle a multinational portfolio. It was as though I was chiselling off a chunk of the Antarctic shelf or using a chainsaw to clear cut the Amazon myself. There was no surprise I felt the guilt behind it all. I was the man responsible. And my journal became my confessional. Heading over two degrees, an irreversible imbalance it seems in any meaningful frame of time for humankind, from the baseline of a pre-industry 1750 before that very British revolution began its journey to a revered worldwide institution causing us to gaze through the prisms of capitalism and imperialism. Those collapsing twin tower ideas augmented all those years by church, military and business careers. An empire forged with manacles and fetters, instructing the indigenous that Christianity is better, teaching them self-sacrifice and ripping them from paradise. Or opening up trade corridors, high seas piracy, high price opium wars. 
History lessons scarce in our national curriculum, lest our children start de omnibus to be tandem, and the making up of their own minds is not a welcome kind of expansive education. Our past open to interrogation and examination. Perhaps reconciliation. It's expensive being reconciled. More cost-effective if young brains are exiled. The new Van Diemen's land is must-see TV, Xbox, Instagram. Did I mention two degrees? A dark and hidden history side tracks me easily on days like these. The awful past still has a hold and takes its toll. 30 to 60 million all told, I'm told. And in my stronger moments, I may feel bold enough to say in hushed tones, we stand on a mountain of bones, don't we? How is it that I know the horrors of Bergen-Belsen, but not the pro-slave position of Horatio Nelson? Two degrees three degrees. We step away from the Holocene, the hottest it's ever been for human beings. I glance over our national shoulder, see the constant wrestle with our Sisyphean boulder while struggling to face the fact that we're almost out of functioning habitat. Three degrees, four degrees. I'm not the only one who sees the link between our pioneering past and the brink. The world is spinning. Wheels, cogs, pistons, rods, switches, knobs, a pea soup fog of perpetual motion, accelerated and celebrated when Britannia began to warm the ocean. On my lengthening task list, there's a planet to save. Do you have an Earth first flag I should wave? I'm on the donation page of Extinction Rebellion. You can count the arrests if you switch your telly on. And I've stopped flying. I have a vegan diet. At barbecues, I'm an absolute riot. I've learned peaceful protests and sat in the cloistered quiet of a wooded hillside, hoping the JCBs never arrive. So what? It's tough. And none of it is ever enough. And I don't need your Facebook likes. I just need to know my values and actions are as right as they can be. But now it's 2021. And there's no clearer vision. Decades have passed without a just transition to green economies and local economies. So now, frantic fingers fumble for the kill switch and look to debug the programming glitch. A few have begun to dig the ditch to bury alive our industrial Frankenstein monster, only for the corporate type to rebirth it out of the sewer pipe. We and our creation are bound together, seemingly forever and ever. Amen. I'm leaning towards a rising consensus here that underscores my growing fears and has given us all just six years, four degrees, five degrees and counting, and the evidence is mounting, overwhelming, actually. Historical accuracy, physics and chemistry so factually provable. The logic is becoming irresistible, immovable. And I'm sandwiched between a history splattered with red and black and a tomorrow where we've borrowed too much to pay back. I've stepped upon and I've slipped down the cracks and I'm trapped, praying now for some deus ex machina saviour, some archangel, a canonised charge of the light brigade, and sweating, fretting about whether someone from the comedic divine will step out of eternity in the nick of time and deliver a better sounding punchline, all things considered, than the joke currently being delivered. I've grown doubtful of the second coming, I've not lost all hope, but the Messiah I had money on looks out of the running. And I've grieved over our old empire state. I'm mad about the two degrees of warming and the planet's fate when it's all served up on a fate accompli plate by glazed and blood streaked gammon steaks and the evangelical right who just can't wait for Messiah's returning and the sight of faithless left wing sinners burning. Climate change may usher in the new Jerusalem for them. And I'm the first to concede we need a new world order. It's been steadily downhill since before Abel's slaughter. A brand new planet is not without merit. But I'm told being meek is how you inherit. 
I'm leaning towards the science, crunching on the hard data. 2026 is too early for the apocalypse. I need it to be later. Never, in fact. There's still time to act, isn't there? The headstone may have been cut to size. The engraver paid to record our demise, but within the narrowest of scope of what some would describe as ill-judged and physic-defying hope. A bargaining plea before the hangman's rope. I'm not ready to admit we're nearing the end. Humankind's obituary surely has been prematurely penned. But the walls really are closing in. For the first time, I could see the end of history in my lifetime and how I've played my part. So I got to stop and somehow make a fresh start and ask forgiveness from the generations that come after me. God knows what life will be like by the middle of the century. The climate crimes I've committed means that they may not get a whole life sentence. So I decided to take the road of unfashionable repentance. But there was the voice of doubt, that inner critic, sitting on my shoulder like Jiminy Cricket, telling me that I'm throwing away a perfectly good career, opportunity, security, in a treasonous two fingers to free market purity. Jiminy says, you'll regret it, you'll see, and your family will know you as a failure, you bailer. I don't remember when I set sail. But I do recall when I decided to bail, there was no chance of weighing anchor. That's not what you do as an investment banker. And this ship sails on. It never stops. Past factory farms and sweating shops. Past the overflowing carbon sinks. Past downtown red lights. Nudge, nudge. Wink, wink. Past fingerless fishermen that catch your lobster. Monsters there are, but also mobsters and racketeers and market riggers and figures who know how to manipulate figures. And whatever it said on the nautical map, we traded our souls in a Faustian trap. I'd long begun to load this trip on board this seven-star luxury prison ship that sails on with dead men crewing and gold in the hold and industry captains spewing their bile. But you know, I worked with them for a while. I ate with them. I got pissed and I slept with them. And they'll never change until they change. But I can't wait for them to rearrange their thinking. And just so you know, this ship is sinking. An iceberg just floated out of line and hold it below the waterline. And despite all the high-tech circuitry, the ocean floors are mathematical certainty. It's too far from shore to be safely moored, so this man is going overboard. I'll take my chance and swim naked to shore. I'll dump the Gucci and the Christian door, the Lotus and the Mercedes Benz. There's still time to make amends. So, overboard I went, clutching nothing but my notes of dissent. Well, that's how you repent in the 21st century. I left most of my life behind and swam to the Cornish shoreline. This part of the journey has just begun and it's not always been fun. Change may not be easy, and if you want some advice, it usually comes with sacrifice. I'm not so naive to think we can entirely leave the system, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't tempted by the gold that glistens. And the distraction of Vanity Fair's pageantry. Britain's got talent? Is it comedy or tragedy? Not to mention the winter chills of simply meeting the heating bills. And I have seen the ghost of Cain. He visits Cornwall regularly these days, travels first class on great western trains, or drives his Lamborghini along the new dual carriageway, and on his mobile phone agrees the price of his holiday home, and gives his full-throated support to the spaceport. Do you recognise this place anymore? I know that for everyone like me who goes overboard, there's ten new applicants willing to be tethered to a keyboard. But these days I stop for the dog rose scent on an evening stroll. It opens up the heart's left ventricle. I pick up my pen to write a few lines in my notebook now and then. 
I watch the blood moon rise and rise and follow constellations slow circling and have fallen back in love with the seasons. Although spring is my favourite. I know Tan Staffel is still taught in the classrooms. And I believe it's only a matter of time until sunlight is bottled and sold on the shelves of Lidl. And I know I've perpetuated the myth that the road I trod was the one true path and everyone else had to walk in it. But here is a new start, a new way of looking at things, a rebirth, reconnecting perhaps with myself, faith and earth. I know it might all be too late, but I get this day, this hour, this moment to live my life, to climb the cliff with my notebook and pen and write. At the turn of the low tide, under white-shouldered clouds, the rise and fall of the ribbon path that winds to Constantine, a silhouette rides the wave spine. The horizon is perfection. Ocean and sky drawn by set square and slide rule, sheets of airmail blue, one faded, one new, a white ship balanced between the two. Tangerine dots roped to pots a fathom down where light begins to slow, the seabed pulses at the feet of cliffs whose magma fired faces are spray soaked, waiting millennia for deep times sedimentary cloak. At the turn of the low tide, the wind unsettles, flaps a loose wing, ruffles the taller stems, builds a sand dune grain by grain, chills my skin. Thank you for watching and listening. I hope that you enjoyed this. If you did and want to find out more about me, then you can find me on Facebook under Paul Temi Hardlines, on Instagram PT underscore hard underscore lines, or on my webpage, which is www.ptemihardlines.co.uk. Thank you. <laughs>